Okay. Uh, so I'm Mitch, and um, I'm head of imaging at CineSight, which is a visual effect uh, production company. And um, we do visual effects for feature films. We don't do commercials, and we don't do broadcast television to any extent. I've done a few HBO things, but basically we work on feature films. Uh, and the imaging department is where we do things that aren't visual effects. So we do things like film scanning, we do film recording, we run the theatre in-house um, projection, and you know I have some other duties as well. Okay, and are we um, in terms of imaging? I, do you subscribe? I, t tell me, do, 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 does thirty-five mil film require scanning at six K or four K or eight K? What's your what's your position on getting film into the digital domain? Um, well, it's a tricky one, um, but basically, film is at least 4K. I mean, it's, it's, it's not true. We, we here in our department uh, scan everything at 4K. And when we have clients that require 2K, which is a lot of CG, I mean, people doing computer graphics additions to shots, uh, the, the, the truth of it is that at this point in time, and it won't be true for long, but at this point in time, if you're doing complex visual effects with uh, 3D computer graphic additions to the scene, Say you have a street scene and you're adding a robot, and this is to be like Transformers or something's being you know rendered to very high quality. Um, then, unfortunately, uh, there isn't the firepower to render the CG in a time that would be practical or for a cost that would be practical, even for these big budget films. So that sort of work is done at 2K. Now a lot of these movies are actually done at 4K. And then the effect sequences are done at two k because the just there isn't the time and there isn't the money to do that rendering. That's oh. that's the problem. Um, so you know a lot of effects work is done at two k, but two k is not as good certainly as a print on thirty five mil as a print off the original negative. If you made a direct print off original negative, it's more than four k. Uh, the images that we use are currently 10-bit log. Um, the file format is used as 10-bit log. Uh, and the newest film stocks, so um, like Kodak's 5219 and the family of products that goes with that called Vision 3, yeah. and um, the, f the latest Fuji films, um, actually have a dynamic range that's bigger than that. Um, now, you know, most... Uh, of the high bracket of cinematographers produce images that sit inside the 10-bit log range. But there are those who unfortunately go beyond that. I was going to ask you, um, is 10-bit log sufficient? And so 10-bit log is not... 10-bit log is sufficient in that almost everything that you look at in the cinema at the moment is 10-bit log. And you know, most people are happy with those images, whether they're projected on a 2K or a 4K projector or whether they're projected off a film output. But um, the truth of it is uh, the film stock is capable of more than that. And of course, the old Technicolor, the three-strip Technicolor that ended in the mid-50s, um, ran from 1935 to 1954 or whatever it was. Um, that, of course, had a dynamic range that was way off the scale. So when we recently um, uh, scanned the African Queen for, uh, re for um, uh, an archival restoration <clears throat> to the Blu-rays, um, we tried scanning it at 10-bit log, uh, but we, you know, it, we couldn't see everything. And we, there was a scene, that, the very first scene in the film, which we were using as a test, and it starts off um, with Morley at the piano and Catherine Hepburn, uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn at the piano and Morley giving us giving a sermon. And then it pulls back and it goes across all the black um, students in their school. And then it, there's some windows in the background, and it's in a, it's in a hut. And then it goes to a door, which is all and the windows and the door are all bleached out, like you get in modern films. 
but we thought you know th there should be something in there anyway um, we then brought it all down and exposed it and we could see stuff out the door so we had a problem in that this just we couldn't get it into the file um, so anyway uh, what we ended up, we, we, we experimented with this, and in the end we had to do it at 16-bit log. And in 16-bit log we got the whole image. Now the thing to remember is that this was just the, um, we, we were doing all our experiments on the, um, we were doing our experiments on the yellow, say, uh, the yellow um, pass, because uh, there's three rules of black and white film. Um, but in fact, the magenta, which is, the Greek to us green, but in Technicolor is magenta, um, was way beyond the the one that we looked at experimentally, and we could only ever get the magenta roll using 16-bit log, and obviously it all had to be done the same. So in fact, 16-bit log, and then to to do the restoration, one of the problems is that the film shrinks slightly, all film shrinks. Now this was, this was in extremely good condition. It's kept in the ITV archive, which is, you know, which is very good. It's at a controlled temperature. The, the film is lovingly cared for. The cans are checked once a year you know, for any problems. Um, so th this was really good, Nick, and it went through the scanner, <coughs> excuse me, with, flawlessly, without any problems ever at all. This is the original camera negative, three of them, one for each color. Um, but of course, because they'd shrunk, they'd shrunk slightly differently, and therefore, when you combine them, unlike the original prints that you had, uh, you get a color fringe because they're all shrunk slightly different. So Warner Brothers MPI division in Los Angeles have done special software for correcting this, and it automatically corrects it and does a perfect job. And you look at their Blu-rays, of Gone with the Wind, or The Wizard of Oz, or Singing in the Rain, and you, you'll see this br brilliant, brilliant uh, reconstruction they do. So the thing is that that won't work at 2K. At 2K, the image is too soft for the fineness of detail to actually reposition those three separate images so they can get them on top of each other. You have to do it at 4K, which reveals that the image is at least 4K, right? Now, going back to the dynamic range, there's just one other thing to say about that, and here's the joke. The, the dynamic range on a black and white film is obviously more, irrespective of how much you advance the technology. The, the, the image dynamic range is more on black and white because on black and white film, because the silver is still in it, the black will go black that doesn't let any light through, and the white is, is effectively clear films, 99.8% clear. So you've, the dynamic range is that's the white level and the black is almost stopping it completely. But on a color film, uh, you, you know, the films that we now use, uh, they all have the matrix on them, the, the orange dye, which is to compensate for the print. So all the pictures have an orange dye. So they can never, no matter you know, how brilliant the piece of film, either Fuji or Kodak, both of them are the same, they have the orange dye and therefore the minimum density, um, which is actually called D-min and is a technical thing, uh, is that orange dye, which is obviously, because you can see it, an awful lot higher up the scale than clear film. And the black, of course, is just the combination of the three dyes. And if you actually take a piece of negative that, you know, that's got black and hold a light up, you can see the light through it. So the dynamic range of the black and white film, when you think about it, without even having to do any measurements, is phenomenally bigger. But here's the thing when people say, the old Technicolor does seem so much better. Just, but how could it be? Just think to yourself, not only are they using a black and white negative, but they're spraying the image across three of them. Because there's one of the yellow, one of the sand, and one for the magenta, or red, blue, and green in modern parlance. I mean, what, okay, so, so what you've done is you've characterised the way the dynamic range and colour and all the rest of it fits in, in, in a kind of an ordinary state 10, but pushing it out to 16. What do you feel about... I mean, it genuinely needs 16. I mean, our, our image scientist, uh, he, he reckoned, his analysis was that it was about 14-bit log. Right. I mean, it didn't use the whole 16, but it sure as hell didn't fit into 10. With that as a bar, though, what do you feel about the images that you're seeing coming off of contemporary 
digital cinematographic cameras like the Alexa. Well, before just one thing on um, about comparison with film. Yeah. Um, and I have two th comments actually yeah. that I want to do. Uh, one of them is that we were scanning a current feature film, which we shan't mention, but a, what, what is called a tentpole film. At the, mo uh, at the time we were doing the African Queen, because obviously the African Queen was black and white. We've got two scanners. One of them was scanning this very this, um, 150 million dollar epic film, uh, which is done, you know, was, was done in a full frame, uh, modern, uh, as much money as could be spent really on the image quality with the best cameras, the best film stocks, the best cinematographers, um, shot in colour though, uh, and this, this was a scope film, Super 35 film, um, and of course it was 10-bit log and 2K. But, uh, well, it was being scanned at 4K, in fact, so, um, and downsized to 2K afterwards. So the image on the monitor was scanning uh, a modern film stock. And on the Im other image was, th was this 1952 production, The African Queen. And every single person that walked in the room, they all glanced at the monitors and then pointed to The African Queen and said, Wow, that's sharp! <laughs> Um, now, the other question you might ask is, in my met talking about the three, if you don't know about three-strip Technicolor and you're thinking this guy is saying that there were three black and white films and simultaneously, but was that, that was obviously taken off the film. No, no, they had a special camera that had three rolls of film going through it simultaneously. Um, now, you may not believe me in that, but it just so happens that in my office, I can show you a photograph of a three-strip Technicolor camera and there it is with Jack Cardiff beside it. If you think of the red shoes, where it's actually, there are sequences that almost look like they're handheld, done with that thing, amazing. But in fact, they were effectively handheld because they obviously had to deal with the camera, but they had what we nowadays call bungees, and they had a whole pile of bungees from the ceiling with the camera hanging on them, and so that two people were able to manually move the camera around yeah, yeah, in the scene. Brilliant. It's brilliant. But your bar though, your bar is a film bar isn't it? It's in terms of the way the image is produced. So I'm going to push you to go, to go over to the, to the digital So the digital cameras, um, I mean, basically, uh, I, I think there are some very good cameras now. Um, the, the problem earlier on was that you're replacing, if you want to replace something, you want to replace it with something better. So the idea of the likes of Sony, which was to somehow just try and chase film and be like it was you know that was because that's what they had to do at the time but that isn't really the solution because the point when you would want to jump certainly on large expensive productions where money is less of a problem and quality is a major concern um, you would only really want to move on to a new format if it gave you something new something an improvement or gave you some advantages. Now, obviously there are some advantages for Vox Popsy type things and things like me talking here, because you can, um, you know, if this had been on film, you'd have already have changed the magazine twice. So uh, that's an advantage, but it's not in the end, that's a, it's not actually an advantage in terms of a quality movie if you're the sort of person making, you know, big films like Harry Potter where you're thinking about the longevity and you're thinking about, well, is, you know, 2K is what Blu-ray is, HD is effectively 2K. And, um, you know, that is maybe going to be superseded and therefore you want a quality that's going to last longer than that. So you shoot on film and then, you know, you've got a 4K quality image there. Um, so uh, I think there are now cameras that ostensibly are the quality film. However, there are a number of issues um, that the camera manufacturers weren't willing to accept and which held the situation back and which has been forced by people who are not in the mainstream manufacture of those cameras. So Sony and Panasonic and all those people felt that what you wanted was more depth of field. They, they felt that 
these awful old cameras and the old film system, you know, had such a shallow depth of field and our, our system is going to be better because everything's going to be in focus. And they also felt that 24 frames a second was too slow and, and you, you got strobing and all sorts of nasty effects. And so their system was always going to go at a higher rate. So they insisted on using interlace, which is absolutely horrible and a nightmare if you're doing visual effects. So um, what happened was they pursued that range and you had things like the Sony 900 cameras. Um, but of course, what artists and genuine cinematographers want is less depth of field and lower frame rates for reasons that you know I'll go into later if, if I'm asked. I think, I think but um, uh, the, to, to stick with it, the important thing that happened was they, you know, they felt they knew better, as so many companies do, than their customers. But what the customers wanted was bigger chips. They wanted the chip in the camera not to be a third of an inch. They wanted to have a, a chip in the camera, ideally exactly the same size, 35 mil film, um, so that they could use the same lenses and use the same language that they had and have the same control over the thing. I mean, if you want depth of field, you can stop down. You can use more light. There's a variety of things you can do. But you can't get shallow depth of field if, you, you know, if you've got a camera that everything's in focus. And similarly with frame rates, you, know, you, you can't deal with that. So what actually happened was they went on and on and this, and there was this battle and they never gave in and people went on using film. And it wasn't a big issue. You could just use, you know, if, you, if you wanted to shallow depth of field, you just used film. So therefore it didn't matter that Sony insisted on having this shallow depth of field problem, um, which they didn't see as a problem, but saw as an advantage. But what happened was, and the magic thing in the cameras that I like, is when the, um, the bottom up came along, and the DSLRs, which had big chips because they'd realized that, you know, and there was an advantage anyway for Canon and Nikon, if they made the chips the same size as 35 mil, it meant that they could use a lot of the technology and the camera construction that they had, like mirrors and things like that. And similarly, they could use all the lenses and all the accessories that they had for 35 mil still photography. They could put that on. Well, of course, the imager in a DSLR such as a Nikon D3 or a, um, a Canon 5 Mark, 5 Mark II or whatever, um, they, they are the equivalent of VistaVision in 35 movie photography because in movie photography, the film goes up and down and it goes horizontally in still photography and it has eight sprocket holes per frame. So it's this sort of size, whereas on film it's only this size because it's four sprockets. So, in fact, when they added video to those cameras, and, and of course they were low frame rates because the cameras weren't capable, because they weren't really designed for doing movies, so they were actually still at low camera rate. So suddenly, all these art cinematographers and directors had a camera that gave them a bigger imager than standard 35mm film and a slow frame rate exactly what they wanted and miraculously everybody started using these cameras and suddenly Sony found their sales going down and Panasonic found their sales going down and then they had to act and now you have F3s and A10, AF101s from Panasonic and all these cameras with big imagers you know and they're all over themselves trying to trying to produce these cameras and so at last we've got what we wanted but they never gave us what we wanted we found what we wanted from somebody else which was Canon Nikon who have never produced movie cameras as such. Can, can you explain, because it's quite important, because um, with the move towards higher resolution, higher dynamic range and all the rest of it, there's also a move to higher frame rates. Can you explain why lower frame rates are good in relation to what you were saying earlier? Right, well, it's, it's completely down to what you want. It's down, it is like all these things. It's a creative tool and it's down to what you want. And, you know, if you want realism, um, you know, you use the higher frame rates, but if you want kind of art pictorial, um, then lower frame rates have an advantage. And th this is often called the poster effect, not to do with a poster on the wall, but Stephen Poster, who's a well-known cinematographer and theorist. Um, so basically, the situation is that- You could, you could just have thrown in there. Po didn't Poster shoot Donnie Darker? Yes. He did, yeah, okay. But you say a theorist as well. Uh, well, uh, yes. 
he he theorizes about film oh, okay. and right. um, at, at great extent and was once the uh, pr for, for a short time, you know for a president period of time was the president of ASC yeah. Okay, so um, and he's president of the IATSE, whatever it is at the moment, whatever they call the local one, local one yeah, whatever it is. Um, he's he's president of that at the moment. So uh, you know he's a very interesting guy. He shot a uh, he shot someone is watching me, which is a Ridley Scott film that looks oh, great as well. Watching over me. Um, somebody's watching. Somebody's watching I know, me. I know the one. Somebody is watching me. Watch. Somebody is watching over you. Somebody's yeah, watching over yeah, me. Somebody's well, watching over. This camera is watching me. I just touched my microphone. Sorry. <laughs> so tell us about tell us about the poster effect. Tell us um, about so well, this is a theory, you know, and who can say? But um, basically, the idea is that there is some threshold point above which the speed is sufficient that it's like us walking about in real life. So the images are coming so fast that our brain has no time to process them. It, uh, other than it processes a live image coming in. So in other words, you get to a frame rate, certainly if you were going at 60 frames a second, I'm not talking about fields as in television, but so not 30 frame American television, which is actually 60 fields, um, but 60 frames a second, like the show scan process that Trumbull used, um, that frame rate is, is fast enough that your brain does not have time to process the images other than joining them together into a continuous image and seeing it as a live image and that's it. So there's, there's no other analysis or thought of it. It is a straight image. Um, therefore, television news, for instance, nobody ever, once video, portable video had come in, nobody would ever dream of shooting that or, or documentaries of that sort other than with video. I mean, if you had a news item now on the news that was shot on film, people would query whether it was fake or whether it was real. No question of it. They would feel there's something wrong with this, it's been fiddled with. Um, but similarly, would you want a romantic drama or um, you know, a chick flick, uh, a romantic comedy, those sort of films, would you want to see that on realistic video, or would you prefer it on slightly soft film? Um, now, the main thing here is that at 24 frames a second, um, that is below the threshold, and your brain, in theory, has the time to analyze and consider and um, sort of do a diagnostic on what it's watching. And, and, and analyze it to the extent that it comes to some conclusion. Like, you know, in, in a romantic drama where the males are all passionately in love with the female lead and, and feel for her, and the women all respond to, you know, her plight or to the romantic hero. And they have time to think about that and to think this guy's the good guy and she's the bad girl, or that she's the good girl and he's the bad guy. And you actually have time to really analyze that and even romanticize it. And in your image processing, perhaps even alter it slightly. And if you, for one second, doubt that, consider how traditional film is shot. Traditional film, when it's shot at 24 frames a second, but that's not enough images to get rid of a flicker of problem that would make people very ill. So each image has to be shown twice to make it 48 images on the screen per second, which is fast enough to reduce the flicker to a point where an epileptic person may not have a problem, and certainly uh, the ordinary man in the street isn't likely to throw up, because 24 frames a second projected at that rate would actually make you nauseous. So each frame is shown twice, and the way this is done is there is a wheel if you'd imagine an X, there's a wheel on the front of the projector that rotates, and it's got 45, uh, sorry, 90 degrees of it is, is black metal, painted black, um, black metal painted black, and the other 90 degrees opposing that is also black, and it's on a wheel, and the space between them is, uh, is transparent, there's nothing there, it's transparent. And that spins in front of the 
the lens of the <coughs> projector, or behind it, depending on the projector. And it cuts out the light, and it shows again, it cuts it out. And these are mechanically exactly half and half. <coughs> so per, for each per frame, you're saying per, frame. per frame, this goes through. And so what happens is, you, the, the film is pulled down. The first blade of black is in front of it. The blade comes up to the vertical position, uh, revealing the image. The next blade comes round and covers it up. The film is not pulled up. The frame goes away again and reveals the film for a second time. And then the next blade, the original one, comes back up against. And while it's covering it, the film moves down to the next frame, then revealed again. This happens continually. So you actually have the film covered up twice so that you have two images on the screen rather than one. These are exactly half. So each frame is shown for, for the time that the frame is in the gate, it is shown for a quarter of that time. Then it's obscured for a quarter of the time. It's shown again, it's obscured, exactly half. If you watch a two hour movie on film in a cinema, one hour of it is complete black. One hour of it is picture. Surely an hour is enough time to completely analyze that story and come up with your own version of it and get an engagement that is impossible at 60 frames a second. Now, I'm not dissing 60 frames a second. You know, this is great. And Douglas Trumbull, who I mentioned, made a film called Brainstorm. And he originally um, wanted in this film to make the main film on 70 mil film, conventional 24 frame a second film, but <clears throat> 70 mil, which is um, slightly better quality. And then all the sequences that were supposed to be in virtual reality and that were meant to be real was going to do in show scan, which is 70 mil going at 60 frames a second. And that would have this realistic effect. And that would have been the most amazing film, but the money was never there. And unfortunately, it got made in the end with the ordinary stuff at CinemaScope on 35 and the other stuff on 70 mil, which was a kind of compromise. But that, that you know, showed that he, he understood that effect as well from a different technical point of view. Ah. Is that that's, yeah, covered? Yeah, really, that was really uh, a clear, clear description. I'm wondering in the show scan version that he would have done, he would have had to have maybe put a load of black frames in there because you've had to run the projector at a certain rate. No, they, sort of <coughs> they, they designed special projectors. And <laughs> I went to show scan. <coughs> show scan, of course, is used in theme parks. Yeah. Because in theme parks, you want people to really believe they're on these, these virtual rides. So when they're like the, um, Back to the Future, the ride, which is IMAX at a higher frame rate, um, they, you know, some of these rides use so scan. Uh, uh, famous, the most famous one was the um, Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas that used to have a kind of Egyptian series of theme park um, uh, special attractions in, in the lower part of the hotel. Uh, they've been replaced now, but... Um, when they ran, part of that was using show scan, and they actually had an actor uh, that walked out on the stage, and then later on he was actually projected, and the, the way it was done, the audience never knew, and then he just disappeared, and it was like amazing magic tricks. But um, <laughs> the thing is that I went to a number of show scan demonstrations and some theme park things, and on the demonstrations, as I came out, I did hear some people saying it just looked like video. <coughs> huh. Excuse me. Yeah, well, that brings us kind of neatly back to the issue around the uh, the generation of. Uh, do you want to uh, give me a drink of this stuff? No, no, no. I'm... Okay, shut up. You do. No, I've got. That brings us neatly back to the issue of the, the 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 potential deficits of images generated within the electronic domain as opposed to within the photochemical domain, because there's a general conclusion. Well, I'm as you are a watcher of uh, things like the cinematographer's mailing list and all of those kind of chat places where people discuss these ideas. But um, for instance, I remember the DIT on Anonymous, which has just recently come out, was pronouncing, he got a few slaps for this, <laughs> was, pro was pronouncing the film as thing, <laughs> which is like the, the continuous elephant trap that people fall into. <laughs> get, I should be laughing at this. I'm just basically trying to say, do, how do you think? <laughs> well, I, I, <clears throat> I am not willing to say that film is dead because when I said it in 1982, um, you know, I was proven a bit wrong. 
So I've been really careful not to ever use that term again, <laughs> because that was, you know, two, eight, ten, seven, yes. that's an awful, that's 25 years ago that's or more. Amazing. So, um, but you know, there was a period when HD, which was originally HDVS in the Sony system, and instead it, it was 1125 yeah. back then, um, it was 1920 by 1125. Uh, and it was 15 by 9 instead of 16 by 9. Yeah. Um, and when that came out and they came up with a film recorder and there were all these things and it, everybody, you know, started to say um, that film was dead and this was, this was going to be a replacement for it. And um, well then what happened was these electronic editing systems came along and offline editing and all this and a higher quality was expected for television and it was seen that in the future everything would be in high resolution but these cameras were really dreadful and the recorders were nasty and bulky and editing was horrible uh, and what actually happened was this caused the move back to film that was the great irony it was going to happen in the 80s and it caused the move back to film and again, if you doubt this, I would say that think about the original dramas on television, which were, you know, the single play was in strands, such as Play for Today, Armchair Theatre, Theatre 625, The Wednesday Play. This is what single dramas were called. And after digital technologies came along, you had film on four, screen one, um, you know, and uh, other, other titles of that sort. And they all started stressing film. And in fact, were shot on film. Yeah. So and this was an amazing, this was an amazing thing. And it basically, you know, was, was, was caused by that because suddenly they were thinking, in the future, it's going to be high resolution. I don't want to use that awful camera, that, you know, this dreadful Sony's original HDVS camera that was a tube camera and was all smeary and, you know, had detail done, you know, had kind of uh, false sharpening on it and all sorts of things. Um, and they didn't want these bulky recorders because, you know, they'd been getting lighter and lighter weight and they had smaller and smaller cameras. So the solution was, if you want to um, make this future safe, then if you shoot on film, you know that it's the quality of high definition video. And so in the future, these programs can be transferred to high definition video. And that's why they went on to film, because they realized that HD was without a question the future, but the equipment wasn't anything they wanted to work with. So they had to shoot on a medium that would allow their drama to be shown 20, 30 years in the future, but they didn't want to shoot with that kit. And that actually drove it back. Because when, when I first work, started to work on commercials, you know, they were st all the commercials were starting to move onto, dig uh, to, onto video format, not digital, but video formats. And they were starting to use things like the Sony 300 camera, it was a lovely camera, and um, the Bosch Frenze cameras. And these, these were amazing, lightweight, handheld cameras that produced beautiful pictures. And the first CCD cameras came in from Sony and they, were, they produced a state that, you know, the resolution, everything was down. But hey, the pictures looked great because the color and the contrast was much nicer, uh, more pleasing, more like film, you might say. Um, and so people started to adopt those and we started doing commercials on them. And then suddenly the digital technology came along and the video cameras weren't good enough quality. The 625 digital, you know, the D1 digital tape format, the first one that came along that was a standard, um, the 625 PAL one, they'd made it so good there was, no, there was no digital or analog video camera that could produce that quality. And if you wanted to get the full quality that that tape format was called, you would use film. And so all the commercials went back to film again. And suddenly it vanished and nobody was shooting electronically. And that was amazing. And also there was the new telecines because there was the latest, you know, the things like the Spirit 
came along and the pictures coming out of those things, I mean, the original telecines have been pretty ropey as well, another reason to get off film. But then what you got was you got these amazing digital telecines that produced these fantastic pictures and the, the dynamic range of the D1 was better than any of the cameras, but film was better than it. So it took the whole image and then they started, you know, and there were a lot of those dramas, they weren't just on 16 mil, they were on 35. And American episodics up to the writer strike of two years ago were still all shooting on, on, uh, on film. And the reason they moved to the new, and, 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 and a really good, uh, you know, coincidence took place. You got these new digital cameras that were much better the uh, high resolution systems um, and basically when the, when the uh, potential SAG strike came along um, they all said well we'll start shooting on video and then we go with the AFTRA agreement because the, the television actors union AFTRA had agreed um, a contract with the studios but SAG the film actors union hadn't so the studios all moved onto video so that they could film as opposed to have a potential strike. That's what did it. That was the main thing. And talking of main things that cause these movements, the thing that will kill film is not directors of photography or directors or producers who don't want to shoot on it. There's loads of them. There's loads of directors who've come up through television that have shot digitally throughout their entire career and are desperate to shoot on film because they always love the look of it. So there's no, there's no problem there. There's lots of people want to do that. However, the thing that's going to kill it, and the thing that's going to kill it is not Kodak, who won't be stopping manufacturing it because they can quite cheaply make the stuff. And, you know, and they, 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 they can run it in batches. So they can you know, run a batch and then you know, keep that in refrigerated units and do a batch of some other films. So, you know, they, they can keep making this stuff, but the problem is going to be, I think, with suddenly nowhere to get it processed properly because the labs are dependent for, you know, their financial model depends on release prints and with the digitalization of the cinemas, the putting in of the digital projectors, and the digital projectors sure as hell are better than the general film projectors. In terms of these bashed up old film projectors with, with prints that have been around 100 cinemas previous to this one, you know, compared, even though that print maybe at the very beginning was better, the condition of the projector, because that's not been properly maintained for years, and the, and the, and the possibility that the print has become worn is bubbling around, the, you know, the digital projectors have got a minimum quality that they always meet. So they are better, and the images that you're getting in a general cinema, not necessarily a big city centre cinema, but in, in the majority of cinemas and all the multiplexes, um, you're going to have a better image in general, you can assume, from a digital projector. So that is taking place. That means the huge bulk release prints will cease. And that's where the labs make the money. Don't make any money from, from um, processing the camera negatives. Nobody even prints rushes anymore. They, they telecine it and use digital rushes. So there's no printing off the camera negative. All they're doing is processing this bit of film. It's hardly worth the, you know, it's not worth the cost of the number of staff it takes to man that, you know, to be able to do these night baths through the night, all the rest of it, paying people for working on night shifts. Um, this is only done because they want to get the contracts for doing the release prints. And the release prints are going to stop happening. And when the release prints stop happening, there is no financial incentive for those laboratories to exist. And then, despite the fact you might be able to buy the film, and despite the fact that you might want to shoot it, and despite the fact that you own your own film camera, where are you going to get it processed? And that is the changeover point for film. Let's, let's talk about the within that, because there's political issues, there's structural issues, there's economic issues. Let's talk about the perceived idea of quality with the filmic image. <coughs> and um, for instance, as a for instance, there was a moment in uh, digital video, uh, early digital video. I haven't seen that movie. <laughs> where you take, <laughs> where you take a field 
and chuck it and reproduce the other field so that you've got two fields in a row to try to give it the filming look. You remember all that stuff with like, you know, knocking... You mean on video? Yeah, so that you've got the, fil the film look. You gave it well, I mean, the, the, the film look is as long as you're progressive. If you, if you shoot with a progressive frame rate, that, that's the same as film. I mean, the, the thing, the, the problem was with the interlace, but the problem with the interlace wasn't what everybody quoted as the problem with interlace. The problem was something I've already related to. The problem with interlace was that if you have, let's say, European video, which is, 50 frames, uh, which is 25 frames per second, made up of 50 fields, if that is shot with an electronic camera, each of those fields is actually temporally different because it scans the even lines, then it fills in the uneven lines, or vice versa. I never remember which way around it is. Um, and those are temporally different. That is to say they are a different, a different moment in time. The first field is followed by the second field. So, for example, if you're photographing a racing car on a track and you're shooting it on a 25 frame per second interlace camera, when you watch it back, you will have 50 separate positions of that car. So irrespective of what the engineers say, you are looking at 50 frames a second. 50 frames a second is over the threshold. That looks real. That is different from film, where it was shot at 24. There are only 24 frames. The two fields are two scans, the even lines and the uneven lines are the one frame. And therefore, the the viewer is seeing 24 pictures per second, whereas, or 25 pictures per second if it's for television, um, and the video camera product is actually 50 different moments of time, and that is a completely different thing. Neither, you know, that is certainly better for news, and the other one may be better for a romantic drama, but the fact is they are different, and whether, and you could argue forever whether one was better or the other one was, you know, you, you can't say it because it's a creative or it's a philosophical difference, and they, they are different, and all you could conclude is that for one person, one looks nicer, for a different person, another looks nicer, for one particular sort of production, one might be better, it's a creative choice, just like you choose, I'm going to make it in colour, I'm going to make it in black and white. I'm going to make it at 24 frames a second. I'm going to make it at 60 frames a second. It's a creative choice. It's down to what your production is going to be. All right, let, let me push you a bit then. Because there are certain movies you see that are fully digitally produced and fully digitally mastered. And you can see it as a digital display. And every so often, there's a shot in there that looks incredibly videoy. So there's the shot under progressive terms. But every so often, there's a shot that just screams out video as opposed to the film, the progressive, uh, you know, that was it Max? Uh, uh, well, it's, it's a pr progressive at 24 or 25 frames a second, um, you know, is a particular look and that, and, and that, you know, if you use a camera like an Alexa or like a, like a Sony F3, which is a very inexpensive camera, uh, or a Sony F65, which is a, a, an audacious uh, and brilliant and very expensive camera. Um, you know, if you choose any of those three cameras, which is which is an extraordinary set of different cameras, you know, th th this characterizes where we're at because these are wonderful cameras, all three of them in their different ways. Just th just like 16 mil or 35 or 70 are different. Um, but the thing is, um, if you shoot with those cameras at 24 frames a second, you'll get an image that's pretty like film. Certainly on the the, the Sony 65, which has a large imager in it, um, you know, you'll get a, an image that looks very like film. Uh, in the films that you're talking about, who's to say that the shot that you don't like wasn't shot with an ordinary HD camera and not a digital cinematography camera? Who's to say there wasn't a second camera? And, and, and let's say, you know, it was a Sony shoot, and let's say they were using uh, an F35 as their main camera, and they did some pickup shots on a 900, which is basically an HD camera. Um, who's to say that that wasn't the difference? And, and who's to say that it wasn't, you know, uh, a camera that was brought in in a rush and it was set up for the previous thing that had been a TV <laughs> quiz show? You know, you, th these mistakes get made yeah. and they're not fixable. Okay, okay, 
I, I accept that. So let's just... I mean, think that it, a brilliant example is... Um, um, oh, God. Uh, but, 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 no. Um, you do need to do some cuts in this. Um, no, no, no. Uh, Give me a clue. Uh, the Mumbai... Oh, oh, oh uh, Slumdog, Millionaire. Slumdog Millionaire. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Slumdog Millionaire is a brilliant example of that, where you know you you have a, a cinematographer and director who absolutely know what it's all about, who absolutely are in control of this, this whole point of view, and that was shot with a variety of cameras. The quiz show was shot with the type of cameras they shoot that quiz show in India with, yeah. high definition cameras, but. The, the stuff running through the slums uh, was shot with, um, uh, with a silicon imaging camera that, we, that you can break down into small units. And basically what they had was a tiny little unit on a special hand grip that you could, you know, that you could point it with. And then the fiber optic cable went into a backpack and inside the backpack they had the main electronics package, which is more bulky. And that way they, had, you know, they were able to run around and it wasn't obvious that they were even photographing. Um, you know, and uh, the, the, the dance routine that's like a Bollywood movie in the station and in, indeed all the other shots in the station were on 35 mil film and I knew that some of the other sequences were shot with other formats. You know, that is absolutely the way to do it. And, then, and those all look different and of course that told you what sequence and, and, and he went into cutting a lot. I mean, you're not really aware of just how frequently he cuts between those different scenarios that the story is in. And one of the reasons that it doesn't have to be spelled out, you know, it doesn't have stupid captions that say Mumbai, comma, India. Uh, it doesn't have to say that because these formats, the audience has been introduced to them and the difference is so visible on screen that you know you're in the slum, you know you're in the TV studio, you know you're in the police station, and some of the shots in these areas don't necessarily look that different. I mean, I know theoretically a TV studio and a slum and a police station are different, but if, if, if you're cutting from a close-up and one of them, you know, with a generally vague background, you aren't actually going to know till a wider shot where you are, but you are going to know because the picture is it's genius, it works, and the audience loves it. Yeah. Okay, I want, to, I want to take you right back to uh, when Baird lost the contract to EMI from his 2000, this 200 line system, or 205, I can't remember what exactly what it was, to EMI's 405 system. In a fit of peak, he, uh, as far as I understand it, he called immediately for a 2,000 line system as being physiologically the best. Did you, did you know about this? Anyway, the thing is, the fact- He wanted to show it in cinemas. Well, he, kind of, he kind of immediately leapt to something that's taken us 70 years to get to, or 60 years to get to. Do you, do you think, um, you see, we've come to that 2,000 line point, but we're going beyond it. Do, are we wasting our time going beyond? 2,000 lines, or what, what I'm talking about is this this urge to go to create more frame rate, more resolution, more dynamic range. Are we kind of missing the point here? Um, <clears throat> well, certainly, I mean, y y you know, you have many directors who the first thing they say when they, um, you know, start work on a production is, I, I, I want this to look like 1930s Technicolor. <laughs> And that's, that's what kind of people strive after. And they, 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 they want to have pictures that look like Gone with the Wind. Um, well, the thing, uh, you know, as we discussed earlier in this um, session, the, uh, the dynamic range and the resolution that they had was more than what current video does and, and was more than what the best current video cameras do. Um, so you could say that people that look at original prints from Technicolor film, films um, uh, are, are noticing the difference and that people therefore would like that. I mean, it's obviously desirable to increase the quality. It, it, you, you want, I mean, we're all very happy with film images, what they look like on a giant big screen. Um, and we loved those of us who were in the lucky position of getting to see them, um, 
we loved the road show period uh, when films were made that way at higher resolution. Now, personally, you know, if I had the choice between seeing, you know, a film in 3D stereoscopic, wearing the glasses and, and having dimension, or seeing Lawrence of Arabia projected in 70 mil with a brilliant discrete stereo system that it had, uh, you know, f what they'd now call 5.1, although they had six channel. Um, you know, my, I, I think the money's much better spent on that. I think that that gives the audience much more, you know, for its money. Um, when you get to the bigger screen, the, the frame rate, you know, can be a problem. And certainly on both those systems, on CinemaScope and on Toddy, which were the two system, you know, the, the, the two that kind of broke through in the two systems of 70 mil and, and anamorphic. Um, the, uh, the original producers did try to do it at higher frame rates, but then the cinema, um, the cinema organizations didn't want to have to improve, you know, change their projectors. They, they already had the cost of the stereo sound system, they already had the cost of the special lenses, uh, they already had the cost to make their screen bigger, and they didn't want to get into a higher frame rate, which would mean a different projector in all probability. So, um, you know, and that was an expensive item. So it was always knocked back. Um, you know, I, I like the idea of increasing the resolution. I mean, I think 2K is patently not enough, and 4K is about right. So, yep, I, I don't have a problem with going up to 4K, but what I, but what I, but what I want, <laughs> what I want um, is uh, I want to have the ability of a big imager. And I'm, I'm less interested in how many lines I've got than how big an imager I've got and therefore what lens I can use. So I want a big imager. Yeah. I want cameras like the Sony F65. And the Alexa's not bad. Um, the red, in terms of the size of his imager, is not bad. The Epic is better. Um, and the, you know, the, the, this, is, this is good. Whether, whether you really need more resolution or not, it's an open question. I haven't got a problem with it. Uh, I loved watching 70 mil films. You know, every time they show uh, um, 2001, somewhere or other that's reasonably accessible, you know, I mean, i.e. if it's not any further than Birmingham, I'm happy to travel there to see it if it's shown, you know, on a 70 mil print. Um, and that, of course, is the equivalent of going up to something like 6K. So, you know, yeah, that's great. And, and you know, uh, Dark Knight on the IMAX uh, screen was fantastic because it was shot for it. Now, most of the films you see on the IMAX, of course, aren't shot for it. But The Dark Knight was shot for it and was absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, you, it, it is hard to beat those wide shots in the urban environments that they had. The underground chase sequence with the trucks uh, and, the, and the opening five minutes of that film, you know, are, would put it into my top 10 films, personal top 10 films, as would 2001 A Space Odyssey. So, you know, my, and, and actually Napoleon, Abelgaunt's 1926, was another one of my top 10 films. So three, and, and it, had a, it had a basically Cinerama sequence in it. That goes on a very big screen with three projectors. So in part, um, so, you know, out of my personal 10 best films, I, three of them are in large format. So I suppose my answer would be, I would, on thinking about it, initially I would have said no, but on thinking about it, I absolutely, yeah, I'd love to see more resolution. But not, not at a cost that's going to screw up everything else. It's not worth that. So I would rather have my big imager and I'm not sure that I want to give up a low frame rate. Not for, not for a film that wants an emotional response.